Hello, and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. As you might have guessed, this show is about Haskell, a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Dustin Seegers, a software engineer here at IT Pro TV. And I'm Jose Silvestri. I'm an intern at IT Pro TV. Today, we'll be talking about functional reactive programming. I guess uh, we should go ahead and set expectations here. Um, Going to be just doing a general overview, right? Yeah, and as I understand it, there's a lot of debate about what counts as FRP. It's like coming from the camp of Connell, just sort of wanting to go back to the pure definition of very concretely defined denotational semantics of what FRP is, what it constitutes of. Uh, so we're mostly going to focus on that because I just thought it would be an interesting starting point just for exploration of this topic, given that historically it's sort of the starting point of it as far as I understand it. Okay, Jose. So what do we mean by FRP or functional reactive programming? Um, just doing a brief dive myself, I saw stuff about behaviors and events. Um, could you explain more about that? When we have a problem where our program is constantly interacting with its environment, mm -hmm. obviously, to a certain extent, our outside world is continuous. And usually the values that we want to deal with evolve continuously over time. So we want a way to be able to handle that in a way that semantically reflects the continuous nature of these values. But since we are working in a computer that's discrete, eventually we do need to discretize this problem. But the advent of FRP is that you delay the discretization in favor of modularity and composability and having a more concrete and rigorous way of speaking about our problem it's sort of taking your problem whole meal you are looking at the dynamics of your problem and then you discretize the advantage of this is that first of all you're not making assumptions about the behavior right away okay for example um uh, an example that's given quite a bit it's uh, the difference between bitmaps and vector graphics. Mm -hmm. With bitmaps, you're already committing yourself to a certain resolution, a right. certain behavior. With vector graphics, your logic itself is continuous. It's very composable. And then you discretize because it must eventually go through the discrete interface that is your screen. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, I guess that brings me to my next question, which is... Um, you know, what can functional reactive programming, what types of problems can it solve? Like, why do we even care about it, right? Um, and it seems to me like you mentioned graphics, and I, I saw some stuff during my brief uh, lookup that, you know, it's great for animations and graphics and, ev like, uh, click events and uh, game programming and stuff like that. Yeah, it definitely is. And it was sort of, I believe, the conception of FRP came from, Conal Elliott listening to a talk and it was a talk on functional animation and someone after the talk suggested they noticed that the values were sort of a function from the natural numbers to your domain mm -hmm. of the domain of the problem. They suggested why not have these things be a function from the real numbers to this and that's sort of to avoid all the nasty interpolation that has to go on if you're working in a discrete domain. Gotcha. Um, and just like with our vector graphics example, it's doing what that does for the space domain to the time domain. And that helps with things like animation. So let's say I want to slow in or slow out. I can do that because I'm not making any premature assumptions about what's going to happen over time. Okay. It's sort of, we're not throwing away any information preemptively. And in FRP, that has the interesting consequence of always having access to your past. And that leads to, for example, being able to write functions that accumulate the events that have happened before. Mm, okay, so maybe handling state? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, for example, let's say I have an event that uh, invokes a function that counts, that adds a count every time someone comes into the room. 
something like that. Okay. I can then use an accumulator function to see how many people entered the room overall. Right. And so on. Mm -hmm. Same thing with clicks, for example. Let's say I'm just clicking around. And just that's, That would be a very simple program that, you know, you click around for a bit, and then afterwards you accumulate how many clicks happened. Right. That has uh, interesting consequences that I would encourage the listeners to go in. I'll, we'll probably leave a link to it, but it's something called FRP Zoo, and it has an example of how various uh, FRP libraries handle that problem of counting clicks. Gotcha. Because it turns out to be somewhat non predictable in certain libraries of it. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting little consequence of it. Uh, yeah, so it sounds like um, your examples, uh, either a fire marshal or a click game programmer would have a great time with FRP. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I guess, um, so what, what makes FRP interesting to you? Like um, why, why FRP versus, you know, other paradigms? Well, it's, it's very much the two fundamental properties of it that make it very interesting for me. For example, with continuous time, we have the advantage of composability for reasons we'll get into when we get more into the semantics part of it. But as it turns out, the central abstraction of uh, FRP, mm -hmm. which are behaviors, they are semantically the same thing as functions. Gotcha. So, okay. It's interesting to have a way of thinking of our problem in terms of continuous values in a way that's, that allows us to leverage what's already in our language, mm -hmm. having functions as for cl first class citizens. Arguably, really to do this, that is a prerequisite of it, that you have functions as a first class citizen. Gotcha. It's sort of working with the very nature of functional programming and because I feel like things like state machines and so on are, we're sort of working against our nature when working in Haskell, mm -hmm. essentially. And another reason is that when you have, when you rep represent time as a continuous thing in your program, you have infinitesimally small, well, theoretically infinitesimally small points. So problems like that these two things happen at the same time are a bit easier to answer because gotcha. they just both point to that same infinitesimal point. Okay. Uh, and so it, that allows us to reconcile signals that have different sample rates. For mm -hmm. example, if I have something that happens every other day and something that's happening every second, I don't need to do any sort of complicated you know, thinking to figure out when did the, the, these two things happen at the same time? I see. Okay, so uh, simplifies things a little bit in that regard then. Yeah, exactly. Or actually, a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and to go back to composability, the reason we would, why composability would be a bit more difficult if we were to discretize prematurely is that error builds up. Uh, yes. So a product... <laughs> Composing approximations is sounds like a headache to me personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would rather work with an abstraction that behaves like functions because, little secret, they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's what makes this really interesting to me. It's just, it just feels like an extension of what we're already working with. Cool. Nice. All right. Well, since we uh, we covered what FRP can solve, we covered what makes it interesting to you. Is there anything else you would like to add, or should we move on to examples of uh, FRP in the wild? Uh, yeah, we can move on to some examples. Uh, I would like to maybe go over the semantics of FRP a little bit. Before sure. We do that. Yeah, man. Uh, so. I did mention behaviors, and mm -hmm. behaviors are the central abstraction in FRP. Behaviors represent va con values that evolve continuously over time. They're sort of the way we represent the dynamics of what we're dealing with. And then we have a secondary 
uh, abstraction, which are events. They represent discrete events that right, yeah. may happen. <laughs> like a, a mouse click or whatever else have you. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so the second abstraction, the secondary abstraction in uh, FRP, at least in this uh, instance of F FRP, the more classical one, because in a lot of more modern sort of implementations of it, events are not necessarily secondary and at times they become the primary subject of discussion, but mm -hmm. we're not dealing with that here, mostly because FRP is a very large zoo. <laughs> okay, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of discussion around it that I myself am still wrapping my head around. And this is also uh, an encouragement for listeners for discussion. Uh, you know, if you're on Reddit, please tell me all the things I messed up on <laughs> because I am learning just as much as anyone <laughs> well, else. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we're all constantly learning, but yeah. 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 I just would really love to hear about this because it's always some very spicy discussion going on. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our secondary abstraction events, we can really just think of them as an infinite list of pairs of time values and it's sort of like our discrete sampling of our time and it becomes an infinite list of pairs of time and our event value. And, you know, so that could be what position was the mouse in at this point in time and mm -hmm. that becomes an event. And then a, then over time that becomes a list of pairs of uh, mouse position and time. So that seems like a pretty powerful thing actually like yeah think about like um that that seems incredibly handy yeah for sure and the fact that these things for example events they it, it derives functor and applicative we obviously have things like fmap that have very interesting meanings to our to frp uh for example if there's uh, an extension of fmap apply for that takes in a behavior that contains some sort of functionality in it and an event a and when this event happens at that time it will modify the event into another one that it's sort of like mapping the dynamics of this behavior onto an event and changing the how this event behaves okay it's sort of like an application of dynamics and that seems really powerful to me. That's just one of the reasons this fascinates me so much. The fact that we can talk about composing dynamics and applying dynamics to events. Mm -hmm. Also, the ability to think of your problem as flows of things is very interesting to me because sort of that analogy of flowing seems to work very well. Like, for example, when I'm filtering a behavior that just seems to me like it literally filtering a flow of things oh gotcha oh, okay <laughs> so yeah 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 it's just semantically very very interesting mm -hmm. uh the semantics being so clearly defined and having just a very expressive way of talking about these things is mm -hmm. helpful to me personally it just clicks with me quite a bit yep. uh expressiveness that's very helpful yeah exactly um, and also a lot of the talks I've seen reference why that, you know, that paper, why functional programming matters, mm -hmm. because it seems to be that a lot of the stuff in that paper, why functional programming matters really translates into why FRP matters. And that's going back to really, to me, this being sort of an extension of what we expect from a pure functional language. Okay, cool, Jose. Uh, seems like we've been uh, covering the specifications of FRP. Um, so, what what about the implementation of FRP? Or have you seen any in the wild recently that kind of catch your eye or your attention? Yeah, one of the main complaints that I've seen uh, thrown out by the person who sort of came up with a, came up with the concept of FRP, at least in this version of it he doesn't feel like there's any accurate implementations of 
FRP in the wild, though there are some that get very close. And I'm sure, I think, I believe he's mentioned that sodium, I believe, is a very accurate one. But okay. the one that's... Like sodium is in like S-O-D-I-U-M? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so the implementation that's caught my eye the most has been, uh, there's been two, reactive banana and Yampa. But Yampa, I would rather not get into because that's arrowized frp uh that's the um that was used in a quick clone i think yeah right yeah. which is very exciting yeah and yeah <laughs> I, I wish i could talk about it <laughs> but that would take a while and i i have not explored it enough to be able to talk about it gotcha. our reactive banana is fairly close to the specification we just described awesome. and it's also very well documented and has a few tutorials and a really cool wiki page with some funny fake testimonials that I would encourage everyone listening to look at. Uh, yeah, uh, reactive banana implements, you know, the behavior abstraction, the event abstraction, and it has most of the things you would, you would see in the specification, which we will link a, talk in some slides by Conal specify the specification of like like the actual a API specification. Gotcha. That would take a bit of talking because it's symbolic, so it's kind of awkward to yeah. go over in a podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> only have a 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, Reactive Banana is a really good one. Um, I, it has a really funny tutorial which is implementing the world's worst synthesizer <laughs> there's been quite a bit of success with uh frp and music and sound programming oh that's is that's really cool pretty interesting if you haven't guessed already i'm completely a game nerd too so yeah so this is just very good stuff for most people actually <laughs> yeah awesome uh well uh any other frp implementations out in the wild that you can think of um uh, netwire looked interesting to me but i believe that one's deprecated but it's another arrowized one but uh i believe i mentioned this earlier uh there is the there is a repository called frp zoo which allows you to explore all the uh, at least the most popular frp libraries out there and it has a way of testing out how they behave by that click example, I mean, accumulating clicks and so on. Gotcha. Okay. And we'll probably link that uh, in in with this podcast, um, along with several other links. Yeah. Uh, and there is a Strange Loop talk by the creator of Elm, because back, in, back when Elm started, it was a first order FRP uh, implementation. And... He goes over the various categories of FRP, and that's a very good way to get started journeying out into the zoo of FRP. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I would also like to mention that I, by no means, am an expert in this, and this is very much an exploratory discussion. This is just something that was very interesting to me, and I thought, hey, it'd be a cool topic to just get people talking about it because it, I, I think this topic warrants a lot more exploration. There certainly is, but I like to make more people aware it in case they were not. Sure, yeah, like like me. I was not aware about FRP um, until just recently. So, yeah. yeah, and it's I have just, learned a lot just from talking to, with you today. It's just a really fascinating thing. And yeah, any any knowledge that anyone might have out there very open to it <laughs> <laughs> ah yes constantly learning if you're not learning what are you doing <laughs> yeah get a, get a bit a little bit less dumb every day <laughs> <laughs> my wife might claim that that's a huge challenge but yeah anyway. <laughs> <laughs> i believe in you dustin <laughs> uh all right well uh thanks for being on the show with me today jose well thank you this was really fun and I'd like to thank uh, our audience for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. If you liked what you heard, uh, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Also, please rate and review us on iTunes. It helps a lot. Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the tech skills development platform for IT professionals. 
and they also happen to be our employer. So yeah, send your sysadmins and network admins to www.itpro.tv for all of their learning needs. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again next week. See ya.